Thanks very much. My name is Michael Curran, and actually I've also added Amy Seidel's name to this because she was my well, employer for the last six months where we were writing a proposal. So much of the, the research that I present is, is somewhat exploratory and it's based on more proposal rather than research that we hope to get funded. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the synergies and, and ways in which we can try and bring together the environmental justice struggles and also biodiversity conservation goals, which I feel are disparate within the conservation community. And I think it was uh, well pointed out by the, the moderator that the political ecologists have been trying to raise these issues for many years, so it's, it's not like it's anything new. Um, so I'll be basically echoing a lot of what, is, what has already been said. I'd like to start with a brief overview of the development of conservation science or conservation practice as, uh, over the past few decades from the viewpoint of a very uh, prominent conservation scientist, Georgina Mace. And you have this nice discourse of, um, in the early years, nature for itself, a focus on wilderness values, to nature despite the people when, when sort of proximate pressures on biodiversity were being recognized, which mainly means uh, interpreting uh, Malthusian uh, nightmares of, of populations of peasants being displaced and cutting down forests and, and various really proximate pressures without understanding the structures behind them, the political and social structures that creates that. Um, then we have this discourse of nature for the people as the functions of biodiversity are being emphasized um, and being monetized in the early years of the 2000s and then this, uh, I, I think, a wishful vision that we now will, will have this era of nature and people uh, being brought together under the banner of conservation biology. I call it wishful thinking because the, the, the the era of economization has, has reached a peak, actually, in this phase. If anyone is familiar with the TEEB report, uh, the Economics of Ecosystems and Biodiversity, that came out in 2010, 2011. So I don't know what Georgina is actually seeing here when, she, when she's writing her little time scale. What I see is actually the, 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 the continued uh, penetration of economic thinking and economism into biodiversity research and biodiversity conservation. Um, but it's, even as wishful thinking, it's nice to think that we can actually maybe uh, reach out and see a more pluralistic view of conservation science. Um, that's one point. And the other point I want to make is, in the eyes of many conservationists, um, there's no differentiation of what are people. It's this homogenous group. Um, it's very clear what nature is. It's, it's sort of cute cats, and this is a civet cat from, from Mount Mulanji um, in Malawi. Uh, but people are either considered to be a big homogenous group, no one's really asking uh, conservation for whom, by whom, at whose expense, who's paying the cost of conservation. And if you ask in a little bit more detail, usually people mean the, the really proximate causes, which are actually victims or, or just uh, agents within uh, an unjust system like uh, loggers uh, that we see in this other picture here. Um, and that's an issue that I think really needs to change within the conservation community. It, 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 it's, it's um, of course, from political ecologists and critiques from maybe critical geography. Um, it's, it's coming in in the, in the recent years, but it's not penetrating into the mainstream of the field. We're still focusing on modeling population densities of various um, species and proximate pressures without really looking at the more detailed social science behind it. Um, so when I see degrowth conservation, as uh, we heard in the, in the opening, opening day, degrowth is, is like the politicization of sustainability, while de de degrowth conservation should also be moving in the politicization of, of nature conservation. Uh, because um, conservation and social injustice, uh, they stem from, from the same type of roots. We have this frontier capital accumulation. I could say social metabolism, but it's a degrowth conference, so I may say, say capitalism. <laughs> Um, <laughs> mining, fracking, logging, farming, drilling, pumping, whatever, are hacking away at their earth's surface and they're disrupting ecological communities as any ecological model will, will predict, a loss in habitat, a loss of species diversity, but it's also its, its human inhabitants uh, and traditional cultures, livelihoods, governance systems. So we should see a common drivers of social and ecological degradation which should lead us to the conclusion that there should be some sort of common goal between pursuing environmental justice and also biodiversity conservation. Um, surprising that that's not a, a widespread view. Uh, Yvette Perfecto from University of Michigan has a really nice book on, on uh, trying to link both the ecology and really bringing in really good ecological knowledge uh, along with the political struggles like the Via Campesina movements and uh, peasants, peasant struggles, etc. And that's a really nice, uh, nice example of a sort of political ecology work that takes the ecology and the politics on, on level ground. Often what we see is political ecologists 
might leave out some of the some of the ecological research of the relevant, in which case it's just political economy of the environment. It's not political ecology. Um, and the, the most important point, and this was pointed out by, I guess, one of the most famous political ecologists um, uh, in this Adams and Hutton paper, 2007, is, is the poor often pay the price for, um, for conservation. You don't see us going to the Minnesota um, uh, cattle ranchers and, and putting our protected areas there and rewilding those areas. It's, it's uh, taking the path of least resistance, which means displacing uh, people with uh, insecure land tenure and uh, pushing them. So the key questions or key question of this paper is, is really going to be nothing particularly deep. It's, it's more a pragmatic approach to try and find um, overlaps between indicators of environmental injustice or environmental justice struggles and conservation priorities. Because I, I know how conservationists think. I, I was one. <laughs> and and they, need, they need sort of something big that shows them that this is an issue worth taking seriously. And it, it's my mind that if we can illustrate this, now we're having databases of environmental conflict globally appearing. We've had this sort of data for conservation priorities uh, for years. So why can't we show overlap and really push the message home that environmental conflicts and political struggles over knowing and using and, and experiencing nature will be key features defining the outcomes of, uh, of conservation of biodiversity over the coming decades. This needs to be a message that needs to be pushed into the conservation community so that they realize it's a political struggle. It's not, it's not apolitical, it's not neutral. And then they have to, really, we have to decide where we want to pursue, in what direction. Do we want, on the left-hand side, as a focus on perhaps, um, <coughs> perhaps from the degrowth perspective, of supporting um, resistance movements for big infrastructure projects, for this uh, expanding social metabolism brought on by the, the expanding global economy? Um, or do we want to go in the direction of the right side? And perhaps this is a, an example of the Nature Conservancy, a nice picture of reforesting here on the bottom, and on the top is a nice picture of a, of a mine from Rio Tinto, which are the, the pioneers of so-called biodiversity offsetting, of working with big conservation organizations like uh, Conservation International, Missouri Botanical Gardens, Flora and Fauna International, uh, and we need to put those names out there as well, it's very important. Um, to, to, well, green their projects. And you can understand the pragmatism of the conservationists behind this. It's about trying to extract something in a system they, that they see anyway as hopeless. It's, it's a sort of defeatist, nihilistic pragmatism, in my mind. Now, um, I'm going to go through now a little bit of some empirical work to illustrate a little bit of a start to this process. It's very incomplete, and I'm gonna focus on land grabs and conservation. And just looking at the, the global overlap and, and zooming into a, a little bit of a finer um, scale. Land grabs are important for the above reasons. Obviously, they, they can be considered indi indicators of conflict because they target so-called empty lands that are actually not empty at all. They're generally under um, informal uh, use agreements. Uh, they involve big players uh, in the global economy, like agro-industrial corporations, the finance industry, governments. Uh, and they should be a focus of biodiversity conservation and conservationists, and they are. They are in, in particular cases and in different ways, because uh, this land is generally and usually of very high biodiversity value, and you'll find, you'll find uh, all sorts of research in the literature about the, the, the enormous ecological value of traditionally managed land. Um, some, you'll also find that Many conservationists ignore this kind of research, but um, in general, there should be reason to believe that um, biodiversity loss can be a reason for conflict, because if conservation organizations get involved in big infrastructure projects, etc., it can be a very nice tool to, for, to, to push conflict forward by highlighting ecological concerns. Um, it can be an indirect reason for conflict, because if you destroy ecosystems, you destroy um, the maybe uh, traditional values people hold for them, you destroy the, the quality of water and the soil, etc., that comes out of that, so focusing on maybe these services. Um, so there should be, there, there, we, we can expect an overlap, at least a correlation, or maybe not. Um, but that, that very much depends on, on your frame of reference. And the biodiversity data I'm using here is very much this sort of global conservation data. It's, it's always used in the global conservation discourse endemic values of species. I, I'm a conservationist. I do believe this, this is the sort of data that's important because if uh, we keep allowing species to go extinct, uh, then you know, we're going to end up with a really, really a desperate planet in 50 years. 
Um, so focusing on endemism, on species uh, remaining habitats, on areas of very high species richness, I think is important. It just needs to be complemented with other values for biodiversity. But let's just restrict to the, the more traditional measures first. The data I'm using is uh, species and ecoregion range maps. These are basically, consider this to be sort of one species, for example, with its, its key habitat um, in, in red, and you sort of layer these on top of each other. You, for each sort of pixel or point in the landscape, then you can, you can assess what's called like a benefit function. It could just be the number of species that exist in that point. But there's very complex benefit functions that, that add up species based on giving them a weight for how rare they are or how threatened they are. And there's a relatively complex procedure behind um, how this map, this global map, was created here. You can look at the reference study. It's using the zonation conservation prioritization framework. And you'll see red areas are areas of, of the highest priority for, for conservation. In this case, the, the focus is on protected area expansion, but it doesn't really matter. It's just a, an index of biodiversity value. The blue areas are, are of, of uh, comparably low global importance for protecting species and habitats. Um, the land grab data comes from the land matrix. It's a global observatory of uh, ongoing, so it's quite nice. It's always continuously updated, so every year you'll have a different database than you had the year before as to whether the land grabs went ahead, whether they were cancelled, whether they were enlarged, contracted, what players are involved. Um, there's roughly 1,500 uh, individual land grab cases here. Uh, within the data, you'll see that most of it is orientating towards non-food crops. I'm sorry, you can't actually read this. Non-food crops are here, food crops, flexi crops, and uh, the last is multiple use. And uh, they, they tend to focus in developing areas. So my interest is, is can, we, can we build even a pragmatic argument for the conservation community that those countries that are super diverse in terms of their biodiversity um, are also targeted um, by land grabs because, well, for any number of reasons, as I mentioned, how these, how um, conflicts and, and conservation might be linked. Um, in terms of analysis, it's a really simple, just a correlation of uh, the conservation priority index, so the country's average priority score, and a land grab index, which is the sum of the land that's potentially being grabbed divided by the total area available. To take the total area available, I, I simply excluded um, areas that are mountainous and areas that are unsuitable for agriculture using a land uh, topographic heterogeneity map and a uh, land cover map respectively. So in terms of land cover, that's anything from forest to shrubland to farmland, which is potentially available for producing crops. Uh, and in terms of uh, topographic heterogeneity, just flat regions. And then to see whether we have a, a link between these two. And actually we don't. There's no, there's no direct correlation between uh, a country's biodiversity and that country being a target for, for land grabs. It's not particularly surprising because I'm using national level data. There's no spatial precision of, of looking at the, the smaller uh, patterns, of this fine scale patterns in biodiversity, which is of course important. It's, this kilometer is not going to, this area is not going to be uh, of equal biodiversity as, as uh, 10 kilometers away. Um, so this just tells me to, to focus in at the, the local level is much more important. And in any case, the case specific links remain relevant. So there are points on this graph here, both are log transformed, where you see areas of very high biodiversity value that's on the, the x axis, and a high focus of land grabs on the y axis. Um, as a side note, you can actually almost get a, a significant relationship, I'm sure, with a bit of fiddling with the data, just by looking at GDP and the land grab intensity. So if you're a poor nation, you're going to get grabbed. But that's just a side uh, point. I don't want to uh, look into that. But I will now go into a little bit more of the detail, just for one country, just looking at Madagascar, and a slightly different database. Um, this is the, the Environmental Justice Atlas, it's a database of, of so-called ecological distribution conflicts or environmental conflicts uh, globally. There are, um, if I remember, several thousand, almost 2,000 conflicts now on there. And we can just take uh, Madagascar, where there are 12 conflicts listed. And these are, these are large infrastructure projects like fracking, uh, surface mining, tar sands development, 
if you want to look into one, I've, I've indicated some, uh, some nice literature on, on how conservation is being misused in one of these Rio Tinto mining projects in the south uh, east of the country. A very interesting uh, uh, case study in itself, and I've written on that by, myself, actually. Um, but just looking at, at within Madagascar, because we have this data, this conservation prioritization data, is spatially explicit in grid cells. So looking at the points of these, adding a small buffer around them, because we're not really sure where exactly these projects are taking place and their scale, um, you can show quite nicely that um, if you look at the graph of global conservation priority, what I showed before, so just looking, um, or you can just do the analysis of species within Madagascar. So what are the national priorities? What are the national conservation priorities within Madagascar? Um, we see that the spread of the, the, the ecological conflicts are both, in both cases, national and global, uh, well above the average, and it's a box plot, so those are um, quartiles, so you're, you have a fair guess of being uh, significantly above the average. So this does confirm the fact that actually distribution conflicts are predominantly occurring in areas of higher than average biodiversity. So this is a, this is a nice little message. It's not properly developed yet, but it, it leads me to believe that we can develop a really nice message for the conservation community, really simple, almost free of theory, to say conflicts over the environment are going to be the defining feature of conservation in the coming decades. And that raises questions of, as scientists, how we then use and apply conservation knowledge within the context of conflict, which groups we associate with, because every scientist is not only a neutral um, observer, we are political actors ourselves uh, in our frames of reference, in our own values, in the data that we collect and the alliances that we make with different political actors on the ground. Um, moving on from that, I could speak m much longer about uh, really like going into the case study level and, and how we can compose ourselves um, at the case study level um, within conflicts. Uh, we, we simply have to be aware that these are very complex situations, these are multidimensional. Every single observer can have a different perception of what's happening on the ground within these situations. We all have different values and uh, there's con um, power relationships, etc. at work. And this is the representation of multiple values and interests across different people and different social groups, like the mining company, like the government and the national and the local level, like the indigenous communities, like the immigrants that have moved in because a mining road has been built. Uh, destabilizing land tenure. And, and this will be, I think, the defining feature of conservation in the future and, and how conservationists navigate this. And if we are promoting uh, the values of degrowth and not green growth, uh, we're not going to align with the mining company and do a biodiversity offset, a compensation. We're going to try and promote uh, local resistance. We're going to try and network various environmental groups um, to strengthen environmental justice along with um, reduce resource consumption. And to that end, I, I, I could even talk longer about the idea of democratic institutions like deliberative institutions, and there's really nice work by ecolo ecological econo economists about the use of multi-criteria evaluations that involve a deliberative uh, turn. And in any case, uh, recognizing the complexity and taking a post-normal non-neutrality, not, not a neutral stance, but recognizing where power relationships are influential, the scientist has to be non-neutral and focus on, on the powerless. That's a really important point that most sci natural scientists, they, they can't, they're allergic to it. <laughs> um, and in this way, I think we can really then get to address the, the, the three pillars of, of environmental justice, of uh, recognition, recognition and respect for different ways of viewing and, uh, and uh, seeing the world, uh, procedure, a fair process of making decisions and, uh, and uh, debating issues, and distribution, um, how well outcomes favor different groups. In any case, thank you very much. Um, if anyone is interested, just send me an email for further communication.